Hey everybody, um, we're going to do a quick mini lecture today about mutualism and commensalism. Uh, this is chapter 15 in your textbook, and to start with, I'm going to um, we're going to watch this video um, about leaf cutter ants. looking at some of the world's earliest and most competent farmers. These leafcutter ants make humans look like newbies. We've been farming for 12,000 years. Ants have been doing it for 60 million. We developed plows and shovels. Ants use their own bodies. Their mandibles are shears that cut through leaves with incredible efficiency. The ants drink the sap in the leaves for energy, but they don't eat them. Remember, they're farming here. They're using the leaves to grow something else. But first, they have to haul the gigantic leaf pieces away. This is no small matter. For a human, it would be like carrying more than 600 pounds between our teeth. Then, they clean the leaves. They crush them cut them into little pieces, arrange them carefully in stacks. They even compost the leaves with a little of their own poop. They spread spores around like seeds. Over time, a fungus grows. And that, this highly nutritious fungus, that's what the ants are after. They feed it to the colony's offspring, millions of them. For humans, farming was the origin of our civilization. And it's the same for ants. They are fungus tycoons. Their colonies are true underground cities with a bottomless need for resources. Having this reliable source of food has given them the luxury to specialize. Leafcutter ants have the most complex division of labor of any ants. There are tiny worker ants and large worker ants and enormous half-inch long soldiers that protect the colony. Like human farmers, their abundant food source has made leafcutter ants very, very successful. And this is where two civilizations, ant and human, collide. From Texas to South America, leafcutter ants are huge agricultural pests. Working stealthily at night, they can strip an entire tree of its best leaves in just hours. As their ant civilization grows, they build up the soil in the tropical forests, but they also pose a threat to those around them. And in this way, we resemble them more than we might like to admit. Org. Um, but anyway, I thought that was a, an interesting um, segue into our current topic of mutualism and commensalism. So you can sort of think about what types of um, relationships um, these ants have with the uh, fungi and who's benefiting and who's being harmed and things of that nature. So um, with that, we're going to talk about our key concepts for this chapter, and those are that in positive interactions, no species is harmed. The benefits are greater than the cost for at least one of the species. Uh, the second key concept is each partner in a mutualistic interaction acts in a way that serve its own ecological and evolutionary interests. And that the third is that positive interactions affect abundance and distribution of populations as well as can structure ecological communities. And so that's a segue into our next unit and our next uh, chapter when we start talking about community ecology. So to uh, introduce the topic, positive interactions are one in which one or both species benefit and neither is harmed. An example, uh, most plants form associations with fungi. So they have these fungi uh, associated with their roots. 
and uh, they have um, this association through evolutionary history has helped them colonize land. Um, positive interactions influence key events in the history of life and continue to shape communities and influence ecosystem functions. And uh, re relationships of this nature can be either obligate or facultative. We're going to talk about those a little bit more. So mutualism. Mut uh, this is when there is a mutually beneficial interaction between individuals of two different species. And in this situation, it's a plus-plus relationship. Again, that means that both species benefit. There may be a cost. Um, so one species could, could uh, be... Um, could, could have a cost or both species could have a cost. However, the net effect is positive for both species. We'll take another look at this in a few minutes as well. Now, commensalism is when individuals of one species benefit and individuals of the other species do not benefit but are also not harmed. In other words, it's a plus slash zero relationship. And then symbiosis, um, this is sort of a general term where two species live in close physical contact with one another. Uh, examples here would be um, uh, P. aphids and their bacterial symbionts, as well as humans and bacteria. So we have a lot of bacteria um, in and on our, in our body and on our body, on our skin that help us, um, that are a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship. As a matter of fact, some of the bacteria that we have, we can live without. Um, symbiosis can include parasitism, uh, commensalism, and mutualism. So remember, parasitism is when one uh, species benefits at the uh, cost to another, another species. Um, so mutualism or mutualistic associations are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Uh, most plant species form these mycorrhizae. These are these um, relationships with symbiotic uh, fungi. And the fungi increases the surface area of the plant roots for uptake of water and nutrients. And at the same time, the plant supply the fungi with some carbohydrates. The fungi can uh, improve plant growth and survival in a wide range of habitats. And then also corals form mutualisms with symbiotic algae. Um, the coral um, provide the algae with a home, nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, and access to sunlight, while the algae provides the coral with carbohydrates produced by photosynthesis. Other examples are um, animals such as cows and sheep that have um, bacteria and protists in their digestive system that help them um, digest grasses, break down the cellulose component of the grasses, and then also termites. And so there are protists and bacteria that live in termite stomachs that help uh, our digestive tracts that help them uh, break down the um, hard materials associated with, with the lignans and whatnot. And then uh, on to commensalism. So commensalism, um, there are millions of species that form these positive slash zero relationships with foundation species that provide habitat. And examples are lichens on trees, bacteria on human skin, uh, kelp forests where many species depend on the kelp for habitat, uh, as well as insects and understory plants and tropical rainforests um, that depend on the trees for their, their habitat as well. Some positive interactions are highly species specific and are obligate. In other words, there's no option for another species um, or for either species. Both species are um, are have to have this relationship. And the leaf cutter ants was a good example that we introduced the um, topic today with, the chapter today with. And these ants and fungi cannot survive without one another. Um, so both have evolved to these unique features that benefit from other, um, benefit each, each of the other species. Uh, many mutualisms and commensalisms, however, are facultative and they show no signs or few signs of coevolution. And uh, in other words, they didn't, um, about this relationship through an evolutionary process where they both required one uh, each other. And so, for example, in deserts, the shade of adult plants creates cooler, moisture conditions. Seeds of a lot of plants only germinate in the shade. Um, the adult is called a nurse plant. However, seeds can germinate under various nurse plants. So that would indicate that there's not a, uh, an oblig obligative um, relationship. Um, typically, that would be between two species. And so, essentially, the, there's an evolutionary um, drive for the seeds, the plants, the seeds of the plants to germinate in the shade, um, but it doesn't mean that um, there's a relationship with a specific plant. Uh, if you put up a, a post somewhere, they would likely germinate in the shade of that, that post as well. Um, 
some characteristics of mutualism. Continued mutualisms are categorized by the type of type of benefit that results. So there are trophic mutualisms, and this is when a uh, mutualist receives energy or nutrients from its partner. And then there are also habitat mutualisms. So one partner provides the other with shelter, living space, or favorable habitat. And there are examples in your textbook of these as well. Uh, one species may provide favorable habitat by altering conditions or increasing the partner's tolerance of the condition. And although both partners in a mutualism benefit, there are also costs. So for example, in the coral algae mutualism, cost to the coral includes supplying nutrients and space. Cost to the algae is giving up some carbohydrates it could use for itself. So you can see that but there are costs to both, um, both species, but the, the benefits outweigh the costs. Um, and that should, uh, that was supposed to appear, but anyway, um, if the environmental conditions change, the benefit can be reduced. Let me actually just um, do this. Um, innovations up here. Let's move that above there. All right. Um, and then I got to, oops. That's not right either. All right, so um, if environmental conditions change, the, um, what's going on here? Let me try it again. Sorry for the craziness there. All right, so uh, if environmental conditions change and benefit is reduced or costs increase for either partner, the outcome may change, particularly if facultative for facultative interactions, not so much for obligative interactions. Um, some plants, some ants, um, some ants protect tree hoppers from predators. You see that in the figure on the right, and the tree hoppers secrete um, honeydew, which is sort of a sugary solution, which they the ants actually feed on. Uh, tree hoppers uh, always secrete honeydew, so ants always have this resource, but if predators are uh, few, there aren't very many predators, then the tree hoppers may get no actual benefit. And in this case, the interaction shifts from a mutualistic relationship where both benefit to a commensalistic relationship where only one species benefits, or it could become even parasitic, parasitic if consumption of honeydew by the ants reduces the tree hopper growth or reproduction. And, um, oh, oh yeah, so this is not altruistic uh, behavior, mutualism, and commensalism. In other words, um, each of the species are doing this to their own benefit and not towards uh, the benefit of the other species. Anyway, um, and then I wanted to talk about this um, as well um, because we we're talking about, start to talk about some community composition and that leads us into our next chapter. So ecological consequences of positive interactions. Uh, positive interactions can also influence co community composition. So for example, coral reef fish have service uh, mutualisms with smaller organisms. So there are these little cleaner fish that go in or shrimp that go in and clean the parasites um, from the fish. And uh, there's a benefit that the client receives is greater than the energy benefit it could gain from eating the cleaner. Um, so there are positive interactions um, that happen between the two. So it's a mutualistic uh, relationship. However, it also influences the community composition. And there's been work done in this where uh, coral reef have had their service mutualists um, removed and the, the uh, effects are on the right here so you can see that um, with, with the cleaner the number of species is uh, about up to looks like nine and a half on average I guess and then without the cleaner species it's down below six and then the number of fish present on the reef without, with the cleaner species is up to 80 some odd and that must be per unit area and then without the cleaner species is reduced down to less than 20. So the benefit the client receives is greater than the energy it can gain from the cleaning, um, eating the cleaner, I've already, um, <laughs> that was a duplicative um, thing. But anyway, that gets the cross, the message across, I believe. And so next we will, as I was saying earlier, talk about, um, cons or, I'm sorry, talk about community composition. And uh, with that, I look forward to seeing you guys again soon.